Episode 4, First Year Psych Student. Now we get to everyone's favorite part of SAO, the filler. Yes, I call episodes 4 to 7 complete filler in the show, because nothing worth the substance or plot related happens in those episodes. Now, let's see if SAO Abridged can add some point to this portion of the story. So the episode begins with Silica arguing with her party leader Rosalia about why she can't skin her pet for her leather pants. Silica decides to leave and immediately gets into danger, and as all hope is lost, it looks like her pet is going to evolve, but it just dies. Then Kirito shows up and this happens. Are you unharmed, my lady? Uh, what? I said, could you stop staring at me? It's creepy! QOP. So as Kirito tried to leave because there is a crying child in front of him, she tries to get him to ask what's wrong, and Kirito deflects hard until she says it's not his fault, which gives him Sachi flashbacks. This isn't your fault. What's wrong, little girl? Unlike in the show, with the whole you remind me of my sister thing that turns out to not be accurate at all, which is a better way to make that trauma stick, but now a scarred Kirito asks her what's wrong, she gives him her whole life story, and then, when she's done, he proceeds to tell her how much he doesn't care. No language on earth has a word for how little I care. A quantum supercomputer calculating for a thousand years could not even approach the number of fucks I do not give. The friggin' heat death of the universe could not- Are you gonna tell me or not? Eh, sure, whatever. Does tell her how to get her dragon back, but tells her he's not coming. But then they meet Rosalia, and Rosalia immediately gets under Kirito's skin and Kirito decides to go out of rage. So then the next day, on the quest, we find out that because this girl reminds him of Sachi, he cried himself to sleep the previous night because his trauma has been brought up again. Proving that no matter how much he tries to get rid of his emotions, he really can't because of who he is. <laughs> Him and Silica get through the level, not without some issues, and then the show decides to remind you that it's an RPG by making the process of getting the item a lot more than just grabbing a flower. Well, I mean, we're gonna need like 50 more of these suckers, then we trade them back in town for a gem, which we give to this gatekeeper so that'll let us into another dungeon where we fight a series of bosses to get the real flower. That's insane! Who decided a game this way? You don't play a lot of RPGs, do you? So as they are on their way back from the boss rush, they run into Rosalia. Well, more like Kirito detects them. They reveal they are from Titan's Hand, and Kirito laughs because he thought that they were from something dangerous, like Laughing Coffin. Then Rosalia psychoanalyzes Kirito. First just some surface level things, then this. And to top it all off, you play the tough guy. This invincible warrior you can never hope to be in the real world. Getting stuck in this game was probably the best thing to ever happen to you. This is something that a lot of people could have missed. Trust me, I know them. Unless you're watching this video where I have been saying it this the whole time and will get reinforced by episode 12. The thing that makes him break is when she calls him on how his voice sounds like a girl. And Rosalia thinks she won, but little do they know that Kirito is one of the most powerful people in the game because his wounds heal faster than they can make them. But here Kirito is so angry and violent that it's hilarious. Thing you didn't account for. My numbers are bigger than yours. Funny thing, really. Get to a high enough level and you're basically untouchable. My wounds heal faster than you can make them. We could do this all day and you would not be any closer to beating me. Not that it wouldn't be fun. But I've got good news. You see, there's no need to wonder where your god is. Because he's right here. And he's fresh out of mercy. And then he kills Rosalia, but before she goes, she gets one last hit. It's about how that that's the deepest he will ever be in a woman. After that, it cuts to Kirito and Silica back at the end, and Silica trying to convince Kirito that he can't just get rid of feelings. Which goes as well as you expect. Oh, feelings? Yeah, I don't have those anymore. Went cold turkey. What? You can't just do that? What's the point in loving if you can't feel happiness, wonder, love? 
<laughs> or the sweet taste of revenge. You're right, Silica. What's the point in living if I can't enjoy such simple things? Ugh, close enough. He then tries to invite her to go on adventures with him. This is good because it gives you a peek into Kirito's subconscious for human relationships. He doesn't think he's looking for them, but he is. Or he wouldn't ask someone to join him. Which lets you, as an audience member, realize that there is still hope for him yet. But Silica rejects him because he is the worst person she has ever met. His reaction is... Is that your big plan here? Huh? Make me feel feelings so you can cut me down a peg? That cuts deep, kid. But I respect that. Yeah, that's kind of the problem. So yeah! Then they try to revive the pet, but it doesn't work and it disappears. And all we hear is Silica screaming and a blurred shot of a scratched Kirito. This episode is definitely better than the show, which makes you feel like Kirito's a sociopath because he kills someone and feels nothing of it until season two, but that's the equivalent of retconning. But it's worse because no one mentions it. It also doesn't let Kirito build a harem here because all of them have no chance because there was always only one ending. But now let's dive into the ghost portion. Episode five, Kirito is always right foundation. So we start in a cave with the new Asuna voice. You know, to kill two birds with one stone, she'll explain it. That's it! That's how we'll beat him! Sheep Tar the Sheep King, your reign is at an end. If that thing hadn't already killed seven of us, I'd say this was a really stupid boss. We'll get just close enough to aggro him. Then, our archers will kite him all the way to the village. Once he's there, he'll be too distracted killing NPCs to notice us. Then, we move in for the kill. Ah, good voice work. I really like the new voice. And look at this picture. Look at it and remember him. He's the same guy who was in the Mafia. Remember this moment. Remember! Kirito first complains that some of his best friends have been NPCs, but he hears Gary and, um, uh... We must save my family! You see? Some of them even have fans! Gary. Excuse me! I have to go say hi to an old friend. Who <laughs> won't be a minute. Hey, Gary. Long time no see. We must save my... <laughs> yeah, well, bet you didn't expect to see me again. We must, we must save my family. You left us to die, you bastard. This is Versace. Choke on it. Choke on my vengeance. How does it taste? Yeah, you know what? Maybe he has a point. This is super uncomfortable. Cut to OP. Kirito ends up skipping on the raid, and Asuna confronts him about it. But he is high, so he's incredibly chill about it. She ends up sleeping next to him, and Kirito, being Kirito, shows whiskers on her face while she's sleeping, and spills the beans before she kills him when she wakes up. Asuna ends up honestly confused, and just invites him out to eat to distract him. While they're there... Her and Kirito show off their chemistry with some witty banter in the restaurant, but they hear a scream and run towards it. While Kirito makes a joke about the Kirito is always right foundation, it turns out it's a guy hung up and stabbed. But Kirito says it's fine because it's a safe zone, and Kirito makes a bunch of rightfully warranted piñata jokes. But the guy disappears and everyone thinks he dies. Kirito thinks it was probably an NPC, but that gets undercut when a girl says she knows the dude. And Kirito ends up having to say that the Kirito is always right foundation has hit a rough patch. They walk the girl home and say that they want to ask questions later. As Kirito and Asuna are walking away, Kirito starts going through the mystery and Asuna angrily asks why he cares. Because there is no way that this Kirito would do anything out of the kindness of his own heart without a reason. And he reveals that he really just wants to prove that he was right. And a really revealing line from Asuna slips about how at least she pretends to be nice to people. So yeah, it's another line to reinforce how close Kirito and Asuna are personality-wise. She is just a step ahead of him when it comes to human interaction. But also her way of living might actually be worse. They then go to Tiffany, now voiced by Octopimp, which I know he is a white guy, but does a great black guy impression. This small interaction shows how close him and Kirito are, where they even share the same opinion on the general game population's intelligence. And then when Asuna walks in, he freaks out, and this is why. Hey, T-Dog, what is up in this his house? 
Are you crying? There's just so much beauty in the world, you know? She will not stop. This is one of the best side jokes ever. Did Deets on this gap for us, homie? Sure thing, Kirito. Anything for a friend. Um, but I'm the one that asked you, Chocolate Rain. T-Pain? Why are you ignoring me, bro? You got cotton in your ears? Oh god, I, I didn't mean it like that! They found out that there's nothing special about the weapon and that it was made by a guy named Grimlock. So they go back to talk with the girl and it's in a restaurant again. And the show rightfully makes fun of it. But let me explain something very quick for those who don't know. Sora Online has a huge problem with using cafes way too often. And this episode is a perfect example. We have gone to the same place twice already. And this problem doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Looking at you, Season 3, Episode 1. Anyway, back to the cafe. So they confirm that the girl knows Grimlock. And when they mention a fake dev of her friend, she has a very interesting reaction. But Asuna goes on to say that he is dead. And they find out that it might have to do with Grimlock's wife's murder. Okay, so they were in a guild that voted on whether or not to keep an item and the vote came to selling. But when the wife went out to sell it, she died. She says she, Heinz, and another player voted to keep it. That player being a Lancer named Schmidt that she is obviously not a fan of. And it turns out he's a YouTuber who's afraid of his more verbose fan base. And we get to see more of Kirito's dark humor. Hear that, Asuna? Meat toboggan. Try getting that image out of your head. Gripping his entrails like the reins of Santa sleigh, streaking through the fresh morning snow on a trail of bile and gore, as his eyes beg the same question as the horrified children in his wake. Why? Yoko is trying to calm him down, saying that it isn't his fans, it's Grimlock. She then realizes it can't be Grimlock, so she goes crazy and assumes it was a ghost. Griselda's ghost. And then she gets killed. The Kirito is always right, Foundation. Part 2. I feel I have the least to say about this episode overall, but that doesn't mean that it's bad, but a lot of my compliments and analysis kinda were taken care of in Part 1, so this should be shorter. But mind you, I'm saying this before the rest of the script is written. We start where the last episode left off, and Kirito jumps out the window to pursue the culprit, but jumps into a window and falls. Swing on foot! QOP. Then when we get back to the show, Kirito comes back to the room and get this weirdly funny Batman joke. I figured some random perp would be no match for the world's greatest detective. Oh <laughs> wait, no, that's Batman! And you're not Batman, are you? You will never be Batman. Hey, fuck you! <laughs> <clears throat> that, uh, cut surprisingly deep. Anyway, Schmidt starts freaking out and Kirito dips. Asuna is rightfully mad at him for ditching, but decides to give him food anyway. And before Kirito can make a joke about her not being able to open her menu, he bites into the food and finds it really good. Kirito reveals that he figured out the whole murder mystery thing hours ago. And then, he loses his sandwich. A moment of silence. We cut to the graveyard where Schmidt is at Griselda's grave, begging for forgiveness. But it goes off track real quick when the grave responds back. Question, Schmidt. What did you do? What do you want? Scouts? I can get you scouts. Well, what? No! No, no, no. We just want to know. Oh, I see. You're an orphan blood man. Do you prefer your victims pre-drained? Or do you like to get your hands dirty? Jesus Christ, Schmidt! Oh, so you like them crucified? Well, that'll be a bit trickier, but I'm trying to work something out. Just stop! So yeah, as you may have guessed, those two faked their deaths. Right before they could get to the heart of the matter, how many people Schmidt would kill, Schmidt gets paralyzed by a knife out of nowhere. And it's one of his fans, specifically the meat toboggan one. And he introduces him to his friends, Laughing Coffin, and oh my god, they are great. As soon as he started spouting out Bible verses, I knew this was the same guy from episode two. And the payoff is miraculous. Like, this amazing back and forth. What? It, it's nothing. Forget it. No, no, you sighed. That's not nothing. <sighs> Boss, I get where you're going for. Bible quoting serial killer, it's a great motif, classic, but 
It's a big book. They're not all gonna be gems. Okay, big shot. Name one verse that's scarier than that. Oh, I don't know. How about, no flesh shall be spared? What? No flesh shall be spared. Mark 13, 20. Holy shit, that's in the Bible? Have you ever actually read the Bible? It really gives Laughing Coffin, you know, a personality. Because in the show, they were just big evil murder guild, and that's all you know. Here, at least, they have a trait, and it's the whole Jesus thing. Kirito shows up in a failed entrance and starts cop-talking them until he hears that they sell themselves for 50 bucks. He then gives them lots of advice. You guys provide an essential in-demand service, and you're definitely the leaders in your field. You're laughing coffin. I mean, you gotta cash in on that name recognition. That's what I keep telling him. But the high paying clients won't touch us. They take one look at Reverend Killjoy over here and think we're a bunch of crazy people. Exactly. You could reach a much wider demo if you just toned down the religious theme. What you guys need is a total rebranding, ad campaign, PR blast. Get your faces out there. Let people know you're not just about the fire and brimstone. You are multifaceted, three-dimensional killing machines, and you have got a little something for everyone. Because contract killing is a beat we can all dance to. Oh man, I got chills. And then because of his kindness, they leave him the group as slaves. And peace out. Now, let's talk about how dumb this scene is in the show. Laughing Coffin shows up to kill this group of people. But... Why is it when Kirito shows up and tells them that he has 30 assault members to fight them, they just leave without checking their map? I don't know. Why does a stare down scare actual murderers? Why does Kirito lie about people coming as backup when he can totally take them because he, we saw him in episode 4? And don't you dare say because he wants to avoid killing people because he has already done that. And in Sora Online Season 2, it's revealed he does it again! So someone explain why this scene happens the way it does! It doesn't make any sense! WHY?! Again, had to watch an episode before I said something wrong. And, and this is just what the show does to me, man. Anyway, I don't have to really talk about this next part. It's just explaining what happened with some jokes in between, replacing the object damage excuse with just it being a glitch that happens when you free fall, which makes more sense. But I'd rather have all this exposition dispelled all at once, unlike in the show that spread that crap out through a majority of the episode. Then we get Grimlock, the guy that actually killed Griselda, but here, instead of killing her because she was stronger in the game and had more confidence, he kills her because she didn't make him dinner one time and wanted to hang out with the girls, which is equally dumb, but one is supposed to be funny. And the turnaround that makes him feel bad is equally weak, but again, one is a comedy. But what they did do is take the point from the original and gave it to Kirito to say. And more words than Asuna did in the original. I can't believe you. You had something special. Something most people spend their whole lives looking for. And you just threw it away. And for what? A lousy meal? You never really loved her. You just wanted to possess her. You disgust me. Kid, someday you'll understand what it's like to be in love. You son of a- But since here it's coming from Kirito, it actually means something. And the fact that Grimlock stands his ground instead of breaking down makes the moment a little bit more serious, till Asuna undercuts it by making fun of his hat. So the group takes Grimlock away to beat him up slash kill him behind a tree, and we see that this is definitely the moment Asuna sets her sights on Kirito, by them having their version of a moment. Then they see a ghost and freak the hell out. By the way, Kirito throws his second sword at her. Then the episode ends with Kirito reopening the Kirito is Always Right Foundation. Reopening. <laughs> <laughs> episode 7. Dragon Poo. Yep, here it is, the final episode of Filler before we jump back into the main plot. This episode starts with setting up that Austin and Elizabeth are friends. Elizabeth is the pink-haired blacksmith that never leaves her shop because of her social issues. She says some creepy stuff to Asuna, Asuna tells her to meet someone, and leaves the shop. And Q Q
QOP. Kirito starts making fun of how she looks with how she's a blacksmith and all. You know, blacksmiths don't usually wear hoop skirts. And she can't come up with a comeback. This subtly shows that she is not a good match for Kirito because so far the person he is closest to is the person who can match him, Asuna. I don't know if they purposely set it up that way or not, but I'm going to go with it just like if they did. Anyway, just look at the similarities to Silica and Liz. Silica could not handle Kirito's crazy and broke at the end of her episode. And Liz, well, let me get through her episode before I continue with this line of thought. Anyway, Kirito is here to get a new sword because of last episode. Fun thing that they introduce as a side gag is that they have Liz slip into some 90s lingo. It's a fun little quirk. Anyway, Kirito tests Liz's sword by slamming it into his own sword, and it breaks. Liz kind of blows up at him. What the hell were you thinking? Okay, this is better, I guess. That sword was my baby! Why would you do that? Would you do that to someone else's baby? You mean when I slam a baby into another baby to test its durability? No, that's not something I would typically do. Kirito, still being an ass, is now trying to get the best sword in the game from her, or he will destroy her career. It turns out that she will need a rare metal for it. And the only way to make it spawn is if you bring along a master blacksmith, which she did not think about before she said, Cut to them in the mountains. They have some quick banter about the cold and pants, and Kirito shows off a little of his good side by giving her a coat, and her opinion of him slightly improves. When they get to the top, Kirito gets angry at Liz for wandering around and for not knowing how aggro works. This triggers some trauma for Liz, subtly showing us the real reason she doesn't leave her shop. Kirito just tells her to hide, and when she tries to fight him on it, his past trauma comes up. What? Are you nuts? You can't fight that thing alone! Do it, Sachi! <laughs> Alright, uh, so we're just gonna pretend that didn't happen. Okay? Okay. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Funny dragon fight ensues and they fall into a pit. They can't teleport out, be like every other boss room in this game. After trying to get out of the pit, they just decide to stay the night. So Kirito is forced to discuss Liz's trauma of her losing her guild and... I... had a guild. What do you mean you... Oh no. Oh no, no, no. It was about a year ago. I was just starting to level up my blacksmithing. I heard there was this rare aura that could speed things up, but it was at the bottom of this dungeon that was way too high level for me. I pushed the guys to take me, saying I stick behind them. But then I saw the ore. I got too excited and ran ahead. Didn't see the trap until I triggered it. I got out, but the others... the others didn't. They all died, and it was all my... <laughs> Don't say another word. Kirito... Uh, alright. Yeah, Kirito kind of actually breaks a little bit. This man has a weak heart. They wake up the next morning, and Kirito finds the item they were looking for, and it turns out it's just dragon poo. They use the dragon to get out, and instead of having a confession, but the classic I couldn't hear you moment, they make fun of Liz having an emotional breakthrough. It's so beautiful! I would have never seen something like this if I stayed stuck in my shop! If you hadn't pushed me to face my fears! I've missed so much this past year! Liz, I am super jazzed about this emotional breakthrough you're apparently having, but do you think we could put it on pause for, say, two minutes? Thank you, Kirito, for everything! Liz? Liz, grab the crystal! Grab the crystal, Liz! Grab the crystal! Grab the crystal! When they get back, Liz starts to make the sword, and they make it over the top with Gurren Lagann visuals and Guilty Gear music. Why? Because Yamato SFX, the editor, and the voice of Kirito probably felt like it. Seems like this is why this show takes so long to come out. Anyway, when the sword is done, she gives the sword to Kirito for free, but then Asuna breaks in and goes full yandere on this girl. What the hell do you think you were doing back there? What? I don't- Shh, 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 shh. No talking. Just listening. Because you're my friend, I'm giving you one warning. Kirito is off limits. If I see you try something like that again, I will come for you. And you of all people know how sharp my blade is. 
Are we clear? Yeah. I said no talking. That's a good girl. Now, play along in three, two, one. Liz runs away and Kirito finds her and kind of ruins his, his chance of sex with her when he tells her. Right, the sword. I named it. Oh, so what did you decide on? Well, after what we've been through, I figured only one name seemed appropriate. Sunlight Heart. Oh, Kirito, that's beautiful. Thankfully, I came up with a much better name. I called it The Piece of Shit. Dot, dot, dot. Dragon shit, that is. <laughs> LOL, trademark, Elizabeth. And then followed by like all your contact info. W why would you do that? Hey, how could I pass up the opportunity to cement your legacy? I mean, just think. From now on, whenever someone makes a dragon poop sword, you know what they're gonna think? Elizabeth. Which I find funny that he was caught off guard by the fact that sex was on the table. Then after the credits, we see Liz's shop being burned to the ground. And we know who did it. It's Asuna, you guys. You know, Asuna. Just in case you missed it. Anyway, we are finally done with what I call the filler in Sword Art Online. This abridged makes these episodes very necessary to get Asuna and Kirito's chemistry. And... Also, some necessary events for the finale of the whole series. And also just improves on the first three episodes' writing in general. From jokes to dramatic moments. And we haven't even gotten to the last five episodes. Which I will have more to say on them than in this video. Oh god, those episodes are so long. Um... <laughs> I don't want to think about it. Well... See you next time, and hopefully it doesn't take me more than two months. Bye! Now, if you're here for the last few seconds, yeah, sorry this video took so long, but, like, I'm, uh... I have things in my actual life, so it was just easy to do some of those smaller five-minute videos, and, um, uh... Those sort of online videos, and those who are wondering... I don't think anyone actually watches those, but, um, uh, those who are wondering... When the next episode's coming out, I'm just gonna have to combine it because episode six wasn't good. I'm gonna tell you what I was what I said to him right now. Um, exposition for 22 minutes. Okay, we're done with that. But um, uh, the next few episodes of Sao Abridged are gonna take me a long time because almost every single one of these episodes were 10 minutes, and it took me five minutes to cover all of them with my own cover coverage um, with clips interlaced. And also, I have to f hope that this video just doesn't get copyrighted, so it takes even longer to come out, and the next video will be even longer, and I gotta hope that that doesn't get copyrighted. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing, man. I, 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 I it, uh, this is fun, but also not fun at the same time. Um, if you want to see more of my videos, check out part one of this, if this was your first part for whatever reason, uh, or check out my discussions I have on SAO or just subscribe and you'll know what I upload next and uh, see you next time.